Okay, going, going. Okay, so Graham Hancock and real archaeologist on Joe Rogan at the same time, whoever thought that we would see the day. Uh, Flint Dibble should get an award. Flint, I will buy you a beer someday if I ever can, as I'm sure a lot of other people are lined up to do. I thought he did a great job. Uh, knocked it out of the park. I just have a few comments. When I say a few, they took four and a half hours. So my few comments, I think I wrote down six things that I wanted to talk about. Um, who knows how long that'll take. Uh, one thing I wanted to address. So this video has gotten posted. Uh, one thing I wanted to address. So the links to this, there's been one thing I wanted to address. Uh, nope. So one thing I wanted to address, this is getting talked about a lot on Facebook and the fraudulent archaeology wall of shame. There are a lot of people out there who think that professionals should never engage with pseudoscience like this, that it is somehow beneath us or it's just giving them error. Um, you know, this <laughs> Joe Rogan has, I'm looking, 16.5 million subscribers and... This episode alone has been viewed almost 1.7 million times. It came out yesterday. Uh, that's a platform that I don't think you want to just see. And that is exactly what we have been doing for years. Let me find that hole. This is my evidence that that strategy does not work. Chapman University Survey 2018. Let me shrink myself down a little bit here. Ancient advanced civilizations such as Atlantis once existed. That's 57%. So that's over half of the respondents in this survey. And if it's representative, that's a huge, huge part of the American population. Um, as I said in my talk in Evansville, they can elect anybody they want. So the strategy of non-engagement that was advocated by a lot of my mentors as I was coming up as a professional has not worked. This is what it has gotten us. It has gotten us over half the population believing this nonsense. Um, aliens have visited Earth in the ancient past, 41% so on and so forth. So for those of you who think that non-engagement is the way to go and it is beneath you to listen to these ideas or to give Joe Rogan a click and try to understand what's going on, um, I ask you to answer for that poll. Okay, let me close that. Uh, so let's see. You know, I felt like Flint did a really good job and he did a much better job of being patient than I would have been able to do. Um, so I think he was the right person for this and he was very well prepared. And I would say he was much better prepared than Graham Hancock was. I feel like Hancock's two main points were, I feel like Graham Hancock wanted to kind of put across two things. One was there was an ancient lost civilization. We just haven't found it yet because we haven't looked in enough places. Uh, and the other was people are really mean to me and that's a shame. And we really shouldn't treat each other like that. So. You can see I'm having a hard time not rolling my eyes <laughs> right now. Um, as far as the first point, let's go to a clip where he says some pretty important things here. Uh, let's see, I have an hour 26 in. You had to really put in the time if you wanted to get the whole thing, and I did watch the whole thing. Yeah, you, I can uh, go back we're, up there. We're, we're, we're looking at um, Bimini. less than 5% of the continental shelves that have been studied at all by archaeology. I'm not surprised that we find hunter-gatherer traces underwater. I'm very glad that we do. I would be very surprised if we didn't. But what I'm saying is that not enough of that 27 million square kilometers has been investigated. Only a tiny fraction has been investigated. And that fraction is not enough to draw the conclusion that we can absolutely say there was no lost civilization. Same goes for the Amazon rainforest, same goes for the Sahara. But, you know, I guess the same goes for my backyard. I have excavated far less than 5% of my backyard, so there could be evidence for a lost civilization there. Uh, the point that Flint makes is a really good one, and I won't belabor it. You should all watch the whole entire thing. We have so much archaeological data from this time period where the supposed lost ancient civilization was flourishing. We have terrestrial data, we have underwater data. We have evidence that the hunter-gatherers that were living in Australia, in uh, North America, in Europe, were using all parts of the landscape, including the coast, and they would have been living on parts of the continental shelf that are now submerged. Tell me where the room is for that lost, advanced civilization. Where, where are they living? Um, were they 
limited to that very narrow band that is now underwater? How come we see absolutely no evidence of them on the coast, which sometimes is very close to where the old coastline was? You know, when you look at state level societies, ancient state level societies, they, they are spread out. They have networks. They have uh, towns and cities of varying sizes that are interdependent upon one another. If agriculture is a component of this, or was a component of this, as Graham Hancock says, there should be evidence for that far from the coast. Far. And later on, when Flint asks him about agriculture and kind of pins him down on that, he has no idea what crops they were growing. Um, apparently, it doesn't matter. It's some kind of mystery crop that these advanced societies were, were based upon that there is absolutely zero evidence for, because he says that they're not the same crops that are later on domesticated, that those people just introduced the idea of domestication. Anyway, um, the idea that there's a chance that there's this lost civilization still lurking out there because we haven't looked in every corner of the earth yet. Uh, I hate to call it disingenuous, but I feel like it's evasive and it's kind of illogical because we do have a lot of positive evidence of exactly what was going on. There's no evidence of agriculture anywhere during that time period. There has never been a ship of this great seafaring civilization that was found among the multitude of shipwrecks that have been found that date to Greek and Roman times and even earlier. We can find boats that are 10,000 years old. Um, where are the ships? Where's any evidence of architecture that is convincing uh, on the continental shelf that looks like and, and one of the things I'm going to talk about is Yonaguni, which I think is a particularly bad example, but that's the one that he hangs his hat on. Um, so we'll talk about that one a little bit. Um, and Rogan presses him here in just a moment. Can, but can we say there's no evidence for an advanced civilization in what they have studied? In what they have studied, yes, we can say there's no evidence yeah. for an advanced civilization. There we go. And what we've studied, there is no evidence for an advanced civilization. So we're depending upon the fact that we haven't studied everything and Therefore, there still could be one. It was a lot easier to imagine Atlantis back in Ignatius Donnelly's day before we could actually see the seafloor and see that there was no uh, sunken continent there. So I guess as long as there's places in the Sahara where we haven't excavated every sand dune, there could still be that lost civilization out there lurking. And that's true of the moon, Mars, Jupiter, Venus, and of course, my backyard. Let's not forget that. Okay. So the first thing that I took notes on was his description of the geoglyphs in the Amazon. And this relates back to a video I did years ago uh, where he claimed that they were using some kind of advanced mathematics to come up with these shapes. And I will revisit that video because I think it's important. Uh, but he shows these again and he does not make that claim. So first, let's go to where he is talking about these. It's almost as hinges. Uh, the amount of workmanship that goes into these earth earthworks is stunning. 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 Um, and they are very precise, very geometrical. You have squares. Here you have a square enclosing a circle. You do. Um, okay, so I don't know whether it's that exact same geoglyph. I'm going to find the video here. Uh, it was one of mine. Blah, 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 blah. Okay, here we go. So he's talking. Uh, let me move myself out of the way so I can see myself. That's my old office in South Carolina there. Okay. A place called Jacosa in the Amazon, you can find a square perfectly enclosing a circle. Now that is an exercise called squaring the circle that our, archae our, our academics have given to the Greeks. They said the Greeks were the first person, people who performed that exercise. But now we find in dated sites in the Amazon that this was being done in the Amazon long... Okay, that's total bullcrap. That is not squaring the circle. As I demonstrate in this video, it's a very, very simple geometric exercise. So he is no longer repeating the claim of squaring the circle, which is good. However, uh, later on, let's see. Okay, so he's he's off of the squaring the circle. Um, that's good. This comment, though, kind of struck me, and I wanted to play it in opposition to um, him being shown to be wrong in this and in other cases. Opponent of my work. He's talking uh, about Michael Shermer. Michael, Michael Shermer, in my view, by the way, and I want to thank Michael for this, a true gentleman. True gentleman. Uh, when he realizes he's got something wrong, he says so. Mm -hmm. And here he says... That's what a true gentleman would do. So um, I think that's what a credible person does, too. And everything that I have ever written about this stuff or talked about, uh, sometimes I say it explicitly, 
And if I don't, I will say it now. If I'm ever wrong, you tell me that I'm wrong and show me that I'm wrong, and we'll talk about why I'm wrong. But I feel like I and others have um, made it very, very clear that Graham Hancock has been wrong on many details, and I don't hear him backing off on this stuff. Things drop out of the presentations, but and I could be wrong about that. So show me the retraction where you said I made a mistake on squaring the circle. Okay, that was point number one. Point number two, uh, let's see, let's go to the Yonaguni. Uh, we are, let me find my notes here. Yonaguni, that's one of the earliest things he talks about, 45 minutes in. Uh, disappearing uh, into a tunnel. And that tunnel uh, looks to me, uh, this is in Japan, by the way, off the island of Yonaguni. We get a lot of looks to me. It looks to me. That's that's the context of the claim. This looks to me as if it is something. Goonie. That tunnel looks to me mm -hmm. uh, very man-made, particularly when I get inside it and find two, on each side, two big megaliths piled one on top of the other. Uh, and then when you come to the end of the tunnel, you see ahead of you these two massive megalithic blocks um, directly in view from the tunnel. Uh, that's a sh so here's what he's talking about. These two, he's calling them two megalithic blocks. That looks like it has a right angle there. They look fairly regular with this, you know, space between them. So, uh, sure. We... Shot that Santa took of me diving beside those megalithic blocks just to give you a sense of the scale of them. They're enormous. No, they did not fall from a cliff above. There is no cliff above. Uh, so this is a picture that uh, Flint asked him to go back to, too. And I just wanted to highlight this. These are the two blocks. Sure, if you just take a picture of them, like it looks like something. When you look at it here, it looks to me like it's a rock that is just split, which that, that happens. Rocks split, and they sometimes crack in what looks like fairly straight lines. And if you look at the bedrock around it here, there are horizontal fissures that are very, very straight. There's another vertical fissure right here. It continues down to this rock beneath it. I'm not a geologist, and I'll tell you what, neither is uh, Graham Hancock, and to go swimming around and say that this is therefore a megalithic structure. And he's got other examples from Yonaguni too, but he takes the totality of the way Yonaguni, I think, makes him feel. And here's what he says. So, you know, uh, Flint calls him out on this and says, well, how, how do you how do you explain all these other things? And nature does some weird stuff, which is true. And, you know, you can look at the kind of hexagonal rocks that nature makes and these straight fracture lines. And uh, it, it, I think it's easy to convince lay people that this has to be man-made. It absolutely does not. It absolutely does not. So Rogan comes back and asks a good question. He, Joe Rogan here, I'm going to give Joe Rogan a point. He asks the question in the way that I would encourage people to ask the question. And it's basically, you know, let's shut down the canon of things you're throwing out and just give me your best case. What is the most compelling thing? Let's cut to the chase. So let's see what Joe Rogan says. Let me see if I can get to it. What is the most compelling evidence that you've seen in an underwater site that of man-made construction? There you go. Or Good question. moving of stones? Give me the best case. This right? is Karama. Uh, I am not showing, I'm only showing a fraction of the slides that we have from... He's saying I have a lot of other blurry pictures too. Yonaguni. Yonaguni isn't simply that terrace. It's a whole series of monuments which, which continue over a distance of a couple of miles underwater. Um, there's a huge stone face carved out of the rock. Uh, there's a Doesn't passageway. Have a picture of the face. Uh, down at the bottom of Yonaguni, there's rocks have been cleared to the side away from the passageway. Um, it's the combination, it's the combination of all of these different things across an area of two miles off the island of Yonaguni uh, that make that one of my high priority sites <clears throat> for, for man-made workmanship. And the Indian sites are also extremely... So that's it. It's all this constellation of things off of Yonaguni. And the metaphor that I used in my latest talk, which I used to tell my students, is the weak cup of coffee metaphor. If you want a good, strong cup of coffee, you cannot add weak coffee to more weak coffee to more weak coffee to more weak coffee. And that's exactly, you know, Rogan tries to pin him down and say, what's the best case? And he said, well, it's this whole miles long stretch of stuff that all 
looks kind of like it's human made. Uh, he doesn't put it in those equivocal terms. He says that it's inconceivable that this nature could have made this stuff, any of this stuff. Uh, Flint Dibble points out um, it doesn't look like any architecture on land that we see. So why does that make any sense? Uh, and he has pictures of, you know, real submerged sites that have courses of stonework and things like that, that everybody can recognize. And they get into Sacsayhuaman and uh, stuff like that. But um, I think the Yonaguni example, if that's the best one of submerged architecture on the continental shelf for an advanced Ice Age civilization, no artifacts, nothing, some stuff that um, looks weird, but is not conclusively shown to be human. If that's the best case, you know, you gotta ask yourself, why would anybody take that seriously? Um, interesting idea, fun story, cool story, bro, but it doesn't convince me either. Okay, uh, on to number three, a little bit of stuff about Clovis. But if Randall Carlson's be... work on the impact to the... Okay, so we're talking about Randall Carlson and the impact and the scablands and the other, uh, other signs of catastrophe in mostly in North America. What was the ice that was covering North America? In one small landscape. Scablands. What do you mean? Meaning he talks about it in the Scablands, right? N not just the Scablands. He's, he talks about that, but he also just talks about that there's massive evidence of intense erosion. So very quick waterfall, water flow that happened through an area that was absolutely devastating. I mean, look, so the, the, the more rapid a destruction is, the better it preserves for us, just like with sea level rise. Right, but dependent upon how strong the force is, it's right? Hard to imagine how, something. It's hard but to if it's a global how... catastrophe, how is it so ho strong everywhere, yet it's not wiping out our evidence from hunter-gatherers? Thank you. How is it so strong everywhere, but that it's not wiping out all the evidence that we do have from that period? At this exact same point. time. Mm -hmm. We have ephemeral traces footprints, campgrounds, fires, and hearths. Right. We have lithics. Because human beings did survive, right? Yeah, but we have it from this exact same period. Right, but human beings did survive at that same period. And it period. didn't wipe out the traces of them from that period. But the traces you're talking about are stone tools and... Hearths, footprints, mm -hmm. things like that yeah. that are extremely ephemeral. Animal bones and seeds. We have all of these things from the period around this supposed destruction. But do you have them in the area where the supposed destruction occurred? We don't know where the supposed destruction happened because right, nobody's when, ever found that. But with Randall Carlson's descriptions of these massive floods of water, just hundreds of millions of oh. pounds of water... Well, let's go to Jay Harlan Bretts long before Randall. Okay, so that was a missed opportunity there because this is a post that i did uh earlier this year i believe the channeled scab lands are in the pacific northwest and it they were created by the movements of large volumes of water but it occurred over many different floods and randall carlson collapses them all down into one because it's necessary to have all of this occur in, in one single catastrophe there's a lot of science that explains why that cannot be the case. There's stratigraphy to these things. They've been dated in different ways. And as, in terms of the ephemeral traces, let me go to my video here. One of the most famous Clovis sites from that part of the world is down inside the valley of the Channel Scablands. That means it post-dates that event, all those events that would have formed that valley or contributed to that valley. So those, you know, they're right in a sense that you wouldn't expect these ephemeral traces to be where these great catastrophes took place. So if you can demonstrate that there are ephemeral traces down there, then you can say that those ephemeral traces post-date the supposed catastrophe, which means that it is not associated with the Younger Dryas impact that wiped out Clovis because there's Clovis sites, not just a couple tools, but like a cache of points that could in no way have survived these massive amounts of water that were gouging out the landscape. Uh, let me get to that real quick. Flooding. And the geologists will tell you, and I'm not a geologist, but I can read, will tell you that these scablands were not caused by a single large flooding event, but by a sequence of large flooding events. They refer to them as mega floods. They were serious, but it was not one big tsunami of water all at the same time. Um, so the East Wenatchee Cache, as you can see in this diagram, I'm going to turn my finger the other way, and this diagram I'm going to put right here is kind of perched in the middle. It's not... Yeah, so this is the one of these supposed channels that was carved out by this huge catastrophic event that is associated with a, a 
a comet fragment melting all this ice, you know, instantaneously and causing this giant flood that's wiping out all the evidence of this advanced civilization and also Clovis. Um, there's the Clovis cache down inside it. So this is a very delicate archaeological deposit. So it obviously postdates that and destroys the whole argument. So uh, there you go. I have a lot of other criticisms of Graham Hancock and Randall Carlson's use of data from the Paleo-Indian period. Um, get to that some other time. Flint does a good job of presenting, I think, and describing how much evidence we really do have. And if you just sit and listen to a person like Graham Hancock saying, we haven't looked here, we haven't done this, there are big gaps in our knowledge. You know, he's he's right, technically, but if you understand the massive amounts of archaeological data that we have that are related to the last ice age and how none of the pieces of that picture, none of them fit this idea that there was this advanced seafaring civilization trading around the world. And, uh, you know, I think he's picturing something on the level of like the Greeks or the Romans, not a, as he himself said, there's not evidence for any of that. Uh, the next thing I wanted to talk about was, oh, well, that's kind of the agriculture question. This is one of those things that I feel like in Ignatius Donnelly's day before we were able to understand processes of plant domestication, before we were able to place things in time reliably within the Holocene using radiocarbon dating and other dating techniques, it was easy to see this, the uh, distribution of pyramids around the world and distribution of agricultural societies as kind of this pattern that had to come from somewhere. And if you were a racist you wanted them to be white people, and those people should come from Atlantis because that's the kind of the disappeared, and therefore we have a source for that, and so on and so forth. And, you know, Graham Hancock can complain all he want, but those ideas are very closely tied to social Darwinism and scientific racism and European colonialism and imperialism and all that sort of stuff. Uh, now that we actually can date things and we understand how much time is involved and that things happen in different parts of the world um, following similar processes, but at, at different times and with different kind of local and regional contexts, those arguments fall apart really quickly. Uh, Flint points out very well that you have agriculture starting earlier in uh, southwestern Asia than you do in Mesoamerica or in other places. Um, Graham Hancock posits that, you know, he says that he has never said that they introduced, that these, these survivors of the lost civilization introduced agriculture to these people. They just introduced the idea of it. So somehow at the very end of the Ice Age, they're going to get on their boats fleeing from Atlantis. They're going to go to all corners of the world, and they're going to tell hunter-gatherers, you know, you should really start husbanding these plants along so that in thousands of years, you can have a reliable crop and build your own states, your own food producing societies. The idea is absurd and it doesn't line up with any of the archaeological evidence that we have. This is a long process and that it kind of comes from the dynamics within hunter-gatherer societies. Like that's where, where domestication um, starts and archaeologists can hotly debate how much agency is involved and, you know, how this happens and why it happens when. But the advent of much finer chronologies around the world and understanding the archaeology in these parts of the world lets us see very clearly that these phenomena are linked by a common process, not by a common historical source. It is abundantly clear. Uh, okay, let me cross off agriculture. That's a super compelling argument that I think Graham Hancock really had no answer to other than I didn't say they introduced agriculture. It's just the idea. How do you explain the idea? And I think Flint explained the idea pretty well. Um, and it, it's, a it's one of those things that when you understand the information is really, really strong evidence against the idea of this ancient lost civilization being somehow responsible or connected to all these things. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, and then and they talked about Egypt. Let me get to my Egypt notes. Egypt notes, Egypt notes, complaints about people mocking him. They talked about Gunang Padang a lot, which I don't want to get into. Gobekli Tepe, uh, Flint did a great job on both of those topics, I think. can't read my own handwriting. I wrote some of these notes while I was on the treadmill this morning. 
as I was finishing up listening to this, he, he does ask him, you know, amidst all of the, there, let me, I'll find this clip. Look at where, they were using wild grasses in 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 the area of of, of where they the were hollow two in the Jordan Valley. They were using them twenty three twenty three thousand yeah, years ago. Yeah, in the area ago. of those wild plants. But they, but you know, the hunting and gathering part. Gathering is usually plants. So the idea that they were using wild plants that eventually became domesticates, like that's kind of classic how domestication works. Hunter gatherers don't go out and scope out what what they think will be good plants to eat in thousands of years. Like these plants get incorporated into the diet. Uh, and then humans take control of the reproductive cycle. The same thing happens with animals, and some animals and plants are much better candidates for this than others, and hunter-gatherers figure that out by trial and error, agency, accident, all those stuff mixed together. Uh, that was not the quote I was looking for. Did not domesticate them. But then what was your civilization growing? There it is. So this idea of agriculture gets spread to all these different parts of the world, so that means the lost civilization knew of agriculture. So what plant were they growing then if none of these plants are the plant that they were growing? It's a very, very good question. I don't know. That is an honest answer. He does not know. There is no evidence for some kind of domesticate anywhere in the world that uh, would have gone along with this ancient lost civilization during the Ice Age. And you need to be a food producing society to build the kinds of things that he is saying that they would have built. You need to be able to produce surpluses and store them. Where is the evidence for any of that? There is zero, absolutely zero. So find me the mystery plant that these people were surviving on. Um, and then maybe we can revisit that argument. But until then, that was case closed and that was a slam dunk as far as I'm concerned. All right, so a couple things on Egypt. Age of the Sphinx, he's big into saying that the Sphinx has to date to the end of the Ice Age. That's the Robert Schock hypothesis, uh, saying that the weathering was there. I think there's pretty good arguments as to why that is not the case. My notes are so bad. Surprised I ever made it through graduate school. And so what is the oldest construction that we're aware of in Egypt? I mean, we have Neolithic buildings that go back, you know, 8,000 years or something, 9,000 years. Mm. Yeah. I think the oldest construction that we're aware of in Egypt is the Great Sphinx. Yeah, the Great and Sphinx. And the megalithic temples in front uh -huh. of it. That's, that's, that's my view. Uh, and, I mean, but we uh, have no evidence from the Giza Plateau of any occupation that early. And that's one of the most intensively explored archaeological landscapes in the world. In terms yeah, you can't make that argument that nobody has looked in Egypt for evidence of the lost ancient civilization. So you have this amazing monument the Sphinx that Hancock and others say dates to the end of the Ice Age. Where's the society that built that? Because he's not trying to take the pyramids away from the Egyptians. He makes that very clear. So where's, you know, what, what plants were they growing? <laughs> where's, uh, where's, where's any evidence for the, the, the kind of engineering and workforce and things like that, that would have been necessary to put that together. Um, and he has no answer. He has no answer. And that's because there is no evidence for it. I feel like... I'll save that for something else. Uh, the, the whole thing with the pyramids, the pyramids are so sophisticated that they shouldn't exist. Uh, and again, not to take anything away from the pyramids. Hope to visit them one day. I'm sure they are breathtaking and they are a wonder in every sense of the word. But the stuff about them, you know, encoding the the size of the earth within their measurements and, you know, Flint pretty much demolishes that. Um, you can make numbers, come out of numbers, and he explained how he can get a, a more accurate approximation of the earth's, what was it, diameter or whatever, using the numbers 420 and 69. So well played. Um, alignment of the pyramids, that's something that I've... I've I, I really think people are overestimating how difficult it is to find the cardinal directions. And so I will be on that again in the future. I'm going to go to the end. There was a little bit, you know, I won't call it a kumbaya moment at the end, but they did try to have, you know, it was, it was a more civil debate than I thought it was going to be. As Rogan says, there were some tough, tough moments and some tense moments. I think Flit Dibble did a great job. You know, Graham Hancock is charming as usual. And I actually give Rogan a lot of points. He, he rose in my estimation. Uh, for doing this. I thought he was fairly balanced and he asked some pretty good questions of both of them. So good for you. Uh, 
At the end, he says something, though, which I'm going to push back on a little bit, see if I can find it. That archaeology would somehow or another be underfunded. Yeah, it's real bad. At UNC Greensboro just... He's mystified that archaeology could be underfunded and people don't want to support this. And I feel like his program, at least the episodes that I've seen with people like Graham Hancock and others, are actively, actively eroding trust in the academic world and science and other things with these conspiracy theories and saying that, um, you know, people are, are close minded and again, I don't want to use the word disingenuous, but I think you have to be aware of the reach that you have and the things that you say and the impact they have on others. And this was Flint's point. Uh, forgive me if I'm wrong, Flint, I'm going to try to make your point again, which you attempted to make. You know, Graham Hancock's feelings are very hurt that he was labeled as, he felt he was labeled as a white supremacist and a racist and he's anything. And I don't know the guy personally, but I do know, and this is what Flint was pointing out, that the sources he uses, those 19th century sources that he uses uncritically, are the product of that culture and that time period. And racism is tightly, tightly bound to those sources. Ignatius Donnelly and the Spanish colonial sources and so many other people and thinkers and writers that were involved in creating the context of this kind of what, what civilization is and which people of the world and, and what they look like, which of those are, are able to have civilization, which of those are able to develop it. And guess what? It's not the brown people in Mesoamerica. It's not the brown people in Egypt. It's not the brown people anywhere in the world. And there's a reason why Europeans said and did those things. And to take that literature, those ideas, and uncritically incorporate them into a narrative, it, it legitimizes it. And that's a problem. And Flint is right to call that out. And other archaeologists are right to call that out too. So if you don't want to be part of that, you should do more than say, I don't believe that part of it. Like you should actively, actively distance yourself and your ideas from it. And you should look critically at those uh, people who are the forerunners of the same, you know, lost ancient mother culture Atlantis ideas. And if I were you, if you want to make friends, I would um, stop playing the victim. Graham Hancock, uh, I would guess, is quite wealthy. I don't know, but he has done very well for himself. And he has a megaphone, the likes of which most people in the world do not have. And he chooses what he uses that for. And one of the things that he uses that for is to cast doubt on the motivations, the abilities, uh, of professional archaeologists. And then he wonders why we take umbrage at that. Um, I don't have my own Netflix show. You know, he's Joe Rogan's like, why do people have to be assholes on YouTube? I don't know if I'm being an asshole right now or not, but YouTube is what I have friends. Like it's it, this in my blog, like that's the way I can communicate with people who are not my family and who are not other professionals. And so that's what I try to do. And I call it like I see it. And if it hurts your feelings, uh, this ain't beanbag. I guess what's the political saying? It's politics ain't beanbag. You know, if you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen. I don't know, man. We want to change the world. Be prepared for a little bit of blowback. And if you're wrong, admit you're wrong. That's what I think would help. Anyway, that's what I wanted to say about that for now. Good job, Flint.